I'll try. Good afternoon. There are a lot of people. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What? Can you hear? No, you can't hear. No? You can't hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. Well, some people can hear. The ones back there can hear. <laughs> there are lots of people in the room absorbing the uh, sound. But anyway, good afternoon and thank you for being here again. I, this room is just full. The title of today's lecture is one of those dares that we wish we could take. Wouldn't it be wonderful to wake up one morning to find the new, no news of the Middle East except for stories about creativity and achievements? <laughs> it's unlikely uh, to happen, uh, I was going to say in our lifetime, but it's, it's unlikely for it to happen very soon. It's part of the world that defies our yearning for progress and dashes our hopes for peace. And we ask, why is it that it matters? Why? Unavoidably and relentlessly it matters to us. More than ever before, we are interdependent, uh, in, uh, inextricably attached to places near and far, economically, socially, politically, and therefore morally. We need to care about the human beings that reside there because in the 21st century, they are within our realm. Or as a renowned rabbi, Irving Greenberg, has said, within our moral universe. The Middle East has had a hard time moving from being colonized to being independent. There's a long and ardu arduous journey between the two, between the no longer and the not yet, as philosopher um, Hannah Arendt remarked in reference to the time between the two world wars, between the no longer and the not yet. Today we will have a briefing on the conditions in the Middle East their challenges, and yes, our challenges too. I don't know any scholar or journalist who can give us better understanding of that region than Tudi Rubin, a foreign affairs correspondent and, mentor and um, member of the editorial board at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Please welcome Trudy back to the Schimmel Forum. Thanks so much, Sandra. Um, uh, you can imagine that for someone who writes about the Middle East too much, uh, I ask myself, why not just forget about it quite often? Um, I've been going there and writing about it for low these 40 years. And uh, <laughs> it's actually quite depressing uh, to realize that every time uh, you sit down at the computer to write, if you're going to write on the region. And of course, now it's linked with writing about Russia. Iran, of course, is in the Middle East. Uh, it's even linked to China these days. Um, it's sobering to realize that things were better when I started writing about it <laughs> than they are now. I mean, there was a slight upward curve along the way. Uh, I covered uh, Kissinger shuttle diplomacy in the early 70s. I was at the airport uh, in Tel Aviv when Sadat landed, which I think now looking back was the high point of my entire decades of covering the Middle East, writing about it. And uh, I was on the White House lawn when, when um, <clears throat> Arafat and Rabin uh, painfully shook hands uh, with Clinton beaming in the background. Um, I was also in Israel during the first and second intifadas uh, when it all came apart. Um, and uh, I was in Tahrir Square uh, for weeks when it seemed like the Middle East might rejuvenate. But even then, uh, talking with those wonderful young people <coughs> who were there, excuse me, I'm just going to grab my coffee. <coughs> Even, even talking with those young people, many of whom had Western degrees and were experts on social media, it was clear that while they knew how to organize a crowd 
and uh, get it assembled and call for a specific goal. They didn't know how to do political organizing at all. <coughs> I, I still remember asking uh, people in the leadership of the Tahrir Square revolt <coughs> whether they were taking down names and phone numbers of any of the people they were organizing to come out, and they weren't. Um, these were not people who had Clinton-esque or Obama-esque uh, knowledge of uh, talents for political organizing. This was foreign <clears throat> to their experience, and as we see, <coughs> their influence has long since uh, diminished and been crushed. Um, so it is sobering uh, to look at the Middle East today, and you know, especially this week, uh, yesterday, no, what am I talking about? Today, today, November 5th, is the 20th anniversary of Rabin's assassination. And uh, I, actually it has a personal dimension, which I can't write about, but it, when, when I think of that date, it, it reminds me how much things have changed, not just with the Middle East, uh, the weekend he was murdered, uh, I was away for the first time on a weekend uh, away with my now husband. And we were on the New Jersey shore in a bed and breakfast. And I called the newspaper in those days, <laughs> telephone, telephone. <laughs> I telephoned the newspaper and they wanted a story immediately. And so I sat down and wrote longhand. Uh, um, I think I had, it was 95, I had a Trash 80 then. A Trash 80 was some, a, a, a very early laptop that had eight lines of type that you had to attach with couplers to a telephone. But I didn't have it on this weekend, and so I wrote by hand, and the couple that owned the bed and breakfast didn't want me to call the story in. They were afraid it would run up a bill, even though I said I'd call collect. Um, so I had to go knocking on doors for somebody to let me dictate a story. So things have changed in many dimensions, but oh, how things have changed in Israel. And I'm not going to get into that in my talk, but I'm happy to get into it in questions. Uh, the other uh, event of this week that makes me reflect on how much has changed um, in the last 20 years is the death of Ahmed Shalabi, which I wrote about in a column for the Enquirer that ran today. Ahmed Shalabi was the suave, uh, 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 highly educated doctorate in math from University of Chicago, uh, Iraqi Shiite exile, who was the darling of Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz and um, Professor Bernard Lewis and helped persuade them uh, because they wanted to be persuaded that if they overthrew Saddam, uh, they would find a middle class country uh, ready to become a democracy, which he could lead like de Gaulle coming back from London to lead the French. And in fact, in 2002, Paul Wolfowitz used that analogy to me, telling me that post-war Iraq would be be like post-World War II France. Shalabi died this week of a heart attack in Baghdad, and in ruminating on his passing, it made me think of how, again, things have changed in the last 20, 25 years. I actually met him in 1992. Um, so uh, things, things have changed for the worse <laughs> in the last couple of decades in the region with little deceptive blips upward. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't need to detail all of those changes to you, but I can understand why many people would ask, why can't we just leave it behind? After all, uh, you look at Syria, and now Russia has moved in, and uh, Russia and Iran, between them, are now the dominant players in that country. Um, Iran is now the dominant player in Iraq. Uh, the Arab Spring has failed. Uh, and so some people are, are asking, you know, why not hand it to Russia? Let them suffer. 
remember Afghanistan, uh, let the Shiites and Sunnis kill each other, uh, why not let them rot, is the title actually of a paper written by a scholar uh, for the Foreign Policy Re Research Institute in, in Philadelphia. I mean, he's using that phrase advisedly, and then he goes on to tell what he thinks should be done. But it, it, it's a thought that I think occurs to many educated people now who would never in years past have let themselves think it. I remember many times being told uh, at question sessions, uh, well, let them bomb, uh, bomb them back to the Stone Age or let them kill each other. And that was by people I thought were Neanderthals. But I think now it's a legitimate question that is being asked. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm going to give you a, a short list of, of some of the reasons why I think we can't let them, just let them rot, uh, because the Middle East tends not to stay in the Middle East. Uh, it tends to chase us uh, back to our homelands. And, and it's just going to be a short list, and we can discuss any of the points later in questions. But I think the more complex question is what, if anything, can be done if we're not going to abandon the region? And, you know, I will tell you, this is a question that perplexes me uh, when it comes to Iraq and Syria and Israel-Palestine and the region. And shockingly to me, even many uh, experts whose opinions I tremendously respect I find them flailing around and coming up with solutions that clearly cannot work because nobody can formulate in this very complicated collapsing region uh, formulae that seem to have a chance of success. Uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. The, the reasons why I think we can't just forget about the Middle East. You know, first of all, I think what's going on there uh, has a lot to do with um, aggressive trends within Islam, which are threatening not only the Middle East, but South Asia, uh, Bangladesh, a country which seemed to be free of some of this kind of horrible sectarian or jihadi killings is now having intellectuals assassinated right and left. Um, Pakistan is a horrible mess um, uh, with radical Islamic movements having the most potent roles in the country and I am sure even as we speak penetrating their military which has a huge and growing um, nuclear arsenal uh, I, and and we see what is happening throughout the Middle East region and so there is a and North Africa so the the movements that are flourishing in the chaos that is today's Middle East are a, a threat that cannot simply stay enclosed in the region. Now, uh, some people will argue that the threat is not so much Al-Qaeda, which now has been contained, uh, sorry, not Al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, which has been contained. Uh, I have had people argue to me that ISIS is not as dangerous as Al-Qaeda, that it's focused more on the Middle East and Al-Qaeda was focused uh, on uh, the far abroad and planning uh, complex terrorist operations uh, in Europe and the United States. And other people have argued to me that ISIS is not the biggest danger. The danger is the ideology that it represents and there are ISIS wannabes forming in other countries, and even if you attacked ISIS in the region, it wouldn't stop that happening. So it's an ideological question. You can't stop it by trying to deal uh, with the Middle East per se. I don't buy that because I feel that ISIS has territory which Al-Qaeda no longer has, um, and Al-Qaeda never had territory of the nature that ISIS has. Al-Qaeda was stuck up in the mountains or in the caves or hiding uh, in Abbottabad in Pakistan. Um, 
th this territorial base is significant because foreign jihadis can gravitate towards it. And even though that flow of foreign jihadis may be slowing, although the figures are not wholly clear, and even though Turkey may be doing a little more to stop them from reaching, because the Turkish-Syrian border is the area that they most easily have been able to penetrate, they are still flowing in. So I think ISIS is a different kind of danger. People are being trained who will come home, and ultimately, I believe, you will have planning for more complex attacks than the lone wolf attacks that you see now. Yes, it is true that the ideology is a danger and that somehow the West has to find a way to fight back in social media against the incredible social media operation that ISIS and other jihadi groups have. But I don't think it's just um, a question of social media. I think there is a territorial issue here, and I think that has to be dealt with because as long as ISIS has this so-called caliphate, it is the symbol that inspires the ideology. Uh, and, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda is becoming less important because its symbolism has dimmed. Uh, because Osama bin Laden was killed and Ayman Zawahiri is barely heard from. And so it has become less of a magnet for jihadis. Whereas ISIS is a magnet not just because it has a great operation on social media, but because it has something to sell. We have a caliphate. They can't destroy it. And yes, it's true that it hasn't expanded that much in recent months, but it hasn't really contracted either. Uh, the Kurds may take back a little piece of territory, but then ISIS takes another piece, little piece of territory. So there's a lot of back and forth, and ISIS can still show these disgusting videos of executions. I'm sure that sooner or later they'll get a hold of a Russian helicopter pilot and have uh, you know his head waving on a video. And so they are still an inspiration for this ideology. And until that inspiration can be undercut, it can be shown to be fading, failing, then I think they're inspiring groups around the world that can threaten governments and that uh, can carry off terrorist <coughs> operations. So in that sense, I think it is a growing danger. I also think that the Middle East can't be ignored and, uh, because, and the reason I'll now give you, I'm not quite sure how we can deal with it, but I'll get to that. Um, it can't quite be ignored because the Middle East is becoming a vast uh, uh, desert of failed states. I mean, and in failed states, bad things happen. Uh, jihadi movements flourish. We don't know that we've seen the end of failed states. Um, but we have to look at the region as a region in crisis. And if you look back in history, when the Middle East uh, structures were falling apart before, say when the Ottoman Empire collapsed at the end of World War I. In the early 1920s, you had the Lausanne Conference and the great powers split up the Middle East. You can't do that anymore. You can't have a big conference where uh, people draw new boundary lines. Uh, when you hear conversations about we need a new Sykes-Picot agreement, you know, Sykes-Picot was the uh, secret document uh, drawn up by a Frenchman and a Brit in 1915 to divide the Middle East between them, between those countries. Now, in the end, it wasn't done exactly like that. It was done a, a, at an international conference in the 1920s. But the fact is you had great powers that could divide things up. It doesn't work like that anymore, and that's one reason why um, it's, it's Syria is so intractable. There's nobody that can put a hand on it and say, done. So we can't ignore the Middle East because it is a collection of failed or failing states with an aggressive Islamic movement or movements ready to take advantage of it. And uh, finally, to, to bring this full circle, all of that ferment, aggressive Islam, failed states, also clearly affects a country that is a close ally of the United States, Israel. And whatever 
one feels about Israel, the Palestinians, occupation, the West Bank, Gaza, and so forth, which is an issue, you know, unto itself that we can discuss, you know, 20 years after Rabin's death. Uh, the fact is that this affects Israel both in security terms and uh, if you look what's going on inside Israel, it's reflected in a weird way by what is going on inside Israel. What I mean by that is that the power of religious movements, which is sweeping through the region, um, is reflected inside Israel where religious extremist settlers and even religious figures in Benjamin Netanyahu's government are pushing for uh, changes on the Temple Mount, the holiest site uh, in Judaism and the third holiest site in Islam, which even if they're not implemented, even if they're just rumored, even if Netanyahu now says we will not change the status quo up there, the hysteria whipped up by Muslim fears that Israel is going to change the status quo on top of the Temple Mount could turn the struggle inside Israel from a struggle over territory between Israel and the Palestinians into a religious conflict between Israel and the Muslim world. Uh, you know, there, there is a member of Netanyahu's cabinet who talks openly about rebuilding of the third temple, Jewish temple, on top of um, uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, the Temple Mount was the site of the first two Jewish temples, the second of which was, des was destroyed by the Romans uh, early uh, AD. And right now, the rabbinical establishment has decreed that Jews should not pray up there at this time. And the security establishment doesn't want Jews to try to pray up there uh, because since 67, the area has basically been under Muslim religious control where Jews and tourists are allowed to come up there, but there hasn't been prayer. And whether or not you think there should be prayer, the fact is if the Islamic establishment amongst the Palestinians or in the Islamic world has the image in their head that the third holiest mosque in Islam from which Muhammad is said to have ascended to heaven is going to be torn down to make way for a Jewish temple. This incites hysteria of a kind that is very hard to deal with. And you have people in the current Israeli government who talk about rebuilding the third temple. You have settlers on the West Bank who talk about it. And then the Palestinian leadership, whether it believes this will happen or whether it doesn't, <coughs> reiterates this, and you begin to have the makings of a religious war within Israel and between Israel and the Arab states. That is only in an incipient phase, but I will tell you um, this could be explosive, and you have fundamentalists in this country, evangelicals, who are egging on Jewish radicals to build the third temple. Uh, if you go to the bookstore at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, you can find books that are read and bought, purchased by uh, evangelical pilgrims who come from this country about the rebuilding of the Third Temple. I have one by the reverends, and I kid you not, Price and Ice. Um, and it's complete with maps of the Third Temple, which will, how it can be rebuilt, where now there is the Third Holiest Mosque in Islam, and there's also the Dome of the Rock, uh, which is a beautiful edifice over a rock from which um, Muhammad allegedly ascended with his steed to heaven. And I have seen the hysteria that this can breed. I mean, it's not new, but now in the atmosphere, in the region, and with a right-wing government in Israel, even though Netanyahu says he's not going to change the status quo, he has cabinet minister who constantly talks about it. The deputy foreign minister talks about it. She's from a radical party. And so, you know, Palestinians will believe what they hear. So I think this is tremendously inflammatory, 
and is a, of, a, of a piece with the dangers in the region of increasing state failure, not in Israel, but the, in the region, and increasing radical religiosity. So I don't think we can afford to look the other way. The problem is, at this point in time, what can we do about it? And you know that is where everybody is tripping over themselves, you know, to come up with op-eds that often have no basis at this point in reality. And even yours truly has trouble writing about what is to be done. I, now we we've learned certain lessons um, from the past few years that I think we have to take into account about what is, do, what is to be done. I mean, one, one of the lessons we've learned is that overthrowing dictators in the Middle East doesn't necessarily lead to democracy. Um, and now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's surprising, uh, the optimism that was out there. Um, you know, I, I would say that I, I certainly had no optimism about Libya. Um, uh, I had a lot of optimism when I first arrived in Tahrir Square, but after spending a couple of weeks interviewing these young people, I had my doubts. And then, actually, when I saw that the opposition could have won an election and elected a president from among them, but they split into three factions. And they actually, for the presidency, got three quarters of the vote. Uh, but uh, the Muslim Brotherhood leader, Mohammed Morsi, uh, got a quarter of the vote, but a slightly bigger percentage than the other three. And I saw that the opposition could not unify. They just didn't have enough experience to play political games of compromise. And so they were outmaneuvered by the Muslim Brotherhood, and then the game was headed towards a bad end. Uh, you know, so there just wasn't the democratic experience. There weren't the institutions. I think Egypt had the best opportunity, and it went down the drain. Um, so all right, we've learned that you get rid of a dictator, and if it's a brittle society where power is concentrated at the top, uh, where you don't have uh, strong institutions, where you don't have established media, this is not something that can transition easily. Uh, this is a lesson that has been shown to us again and again. It's certainly the lesson of Russia. Uh, the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, I was in Russia repeatedly in the 1990s, and here was a highly educated society. But in essence, you saw the same thing. When you had a highly centralized system at the top, controlled by intelligence agencies, without any democratic experience, even in a country that had a large educated population and what passed for a large middle class, they couldn't handle it. They yearned for the security of the past, and now they have Vladimir Putin. Uh, so why should the Arab world do better with no experience in democracy? In Tunisia, uh, you have a slightly different situation because it's a small population very close to Europe, if you look at the map. It's actually very close to Italy across and with a long relationship with France. And, um, uh, and a lot of interchange with France and a, a large secular population. And the dictator made a big point of women's rights and educating women. And so Tunisia, even though Tunisia is struggling, <clears throat> You have a situation where they had probably the best chance, still do probably, but they're unique. And they still have a big Islamist problem because they're next to Libya and it spills <coughs> over. Um, so we know that toppling dictators doesn't necessarily bring you good things. That's number one. And I think we know also that um, if you're going to change the structures in the Middle East, uh, it's it, not only can we not impose the new structures these days, but we need to get the people themselves to help themselves. Uh, and that also goes for getting rid of ISIS. 
it will never work. You can't, if the West tries to do it by itself, you can't just come in there with an army. You have to get help the local people to do it themselves. Now, that brings us to what is to be done. I think the Obama administration understood that you had to ha have to help locals to help themselves, but I think they took that to an extreme. Uh, because just saying, help the locals help themselves, yes, well, what if the locals have no experience? Um, you can't simply do democracy education and expect that a democracy will take root. Uh, you know, um, um, yeah, I was just talking with Sandra about this. Uh, um, we were talking about Afghanistan. Uh, we both know wonderful women in Afghanistan who have been helped sometimes with U.S. funds, sometimes European, to set up um, uh, uh, shelters for battered women, to help set up schools for girls. Uh, we know there was real progress pushed by the United States for <coughs> girls' education. But the fact is that in the province of Kunduz, in the north of Afghanistan, which was supposed to be safer, the Taliban just made a comeback. And the first thing they did was go after women's activists who, if they didn't make it out in time, uh, God knows what has happened to them by now, but they're either dead or in prison being tortured. And the girls' schools are shut. So it's not enough to sort of help with democracy building. Um, the question is, is there any more that can be done? Um, so uh, now we get to the really hard part. Um, I, let me look at it country by country, although I think we do have to look at the overall picture. But I think what could have been done and what could yet be done varies from country to country, although there's a lot of interconnection between Iraq and Syria. I think, first of all, in order to do anything, um, the administration would have had to understand that it required a bigger leadership role than it has been willing to play. Now, I think that in part, uh, the US was unwilling to play that role because it underestimated ISIS. Um, as you know, uh, President Obama referred to ISIS as the JV team only a little more than a year, about a year and a half ago. Um, that was a lack of understanding. I think the administration, because it so badly wanted to be not the Bush administration, just as the Bush administration wanted to be not the Clinton administration, but this was worse. I think they swung too far in the other direction. I think they misunderstood that a push for diplomacy can be wise, but diplomacy can only succeed if you have leverage. Um, and for example, in Iran, the only reason, whether or not you agree with the Iran deal, the only reason there was a deal was because we had harsh sanctions on and the Iranians wanted to get rid of them. If you come into talks with no leverage, if you're not willing to put some skin in the game, and then the other parties to the talks will roll you because you have nothing with which to convince them to make concessions. I think the, the, the Obama administration believed that our, um, it was time to let the Iraqis help themselves. <coughs> and they were not willing to put muscle into that game and they also, because they were engaged in these negotiations with Iran, were unwilling to put pressure on Iran or counteract Iranian pressure on Iraqi leadership in a way that might have prevented something of what has happened in Iraq in the last couple of years. I'll be more specific because I still think there's more possibility of affecting the situation in Iraq than there is at this point in Syria, but the two are intimately connected. I was in Erbil in northern Iraq, which is Iraqi Kurdistan, in May, <clears throat> and then I went to Amman, Jordan. Uh, in Erbil, you have hundreds of thousands of Iraqi refugees who have fled ISIS. At least 200,000 of them are Christians. 
another 50 to 70,000 are Yazidis, and many of them are Sunnis, Sunnis from tribes that <coughs> ISIS attacked when it flowed from Syria uh, east and took over Iraq's second largest city, Erbil, uh, over, well over a year ago, and also refugees from Mosul, this, uh, this second largest, uh, did I say Erbil, the second largest city is Mosul, um, refugees from Mosul, because many Sunnis do not want ISIS, and they had to flee for their lives. So you have this huge number of refugees in Iraqi Kurdistan, including leaders of tribes wh who flow out across the west of, of um, Iraq. And these tribal leaders want to fight ISIS, have wanted to do so, but the it, Obama administration has been unwilling to help them, unwilling to arm them, because it has clung to this idea of a centralized Iraqi government operating on democratic principles that will be one pluralistic country, and they want everything to go through that central government. The central government is controlled by Shiites, who do not want to see Sunnis get weapons, and uh, in addition, uh, it is dominated by Iran, which has enormous influence in Baghdad. There is now a prime minister who would like to do better, who understands the need for pluralism, Haider Abadi, but he has the Iranians with a knife to his back and the Americans with nice words. Who do you think he pays more attention to? I think a formula could have been worked out with a body by which the tribes would have become a national guard. That is what the tribal leaders wanted, that's what the U.S. wanted, but the U.S. simply was not willing to put the effort, the pressure, into making this happen. And they waited too long. It, it, it has been so frustrating to watch because I interviewed all of these tribal leaders, and while I was on this trip, Another major city in Iraq fell to ISIS, the city of Ramadi, which people had been telling me, Trudy Rubin sitting in Philadelphia on the telephone calling Baghdad, was going to happen. I was talking to Iraqi military people. It was going to happen. And yet, when I talked to one of the top administration, very top uh, Obama administration people a week before Ramadi fell, uh, um, he was denying it was going to happen. So there has been a level of unreality bred, I think, by an unwillingness to get invested in this. And I think the president realizes now that's been a mistake. It is much harder now to act. But I think there should be a much tougher focus on Iraq um, with a special emissary. There is one, but he reports mainly to the State Department. He's called a presidential envoy, but he talks mainly to Kerry. He has to speak directly to the president. The president has to make clear that he is concerned, that he is ready to act, that he will back Prime Minister Abadi, that he wants a National Guard law so the Sunni tribes can be activated and push back ISIS. Obama has to make that commitment. He has not made it yet. And unless he does, I think that <clears throat> ISIS will remain strong in, in um, Iraq, where they have their real capital in Mosul, and there will not be the chance to push them back into Syria, which would squeeze them, which would tell all of their acolytes and followers around the world that ISIS is shrinking, it can't keep its caliphate, it is a spent force. There is a much better chance to do that in Iraq than in Syria, and Obama simply is not putting the effort into the fight. Syria is so much more complicated. I really think Obama could have done something two years ago when I was uh, in Syria and on the Turkish border. I met many defected Syrian military officers. They could have been organized into a coherent force led by secular military men, which was the best hope for Syria. And uh, the Obama administration did not want to get involved. They subcontracted to the Saudis. The Saudis, instead of helping the secular defected military officers, helped Islamist leaders uh, who have set up Islamist militias. It's not ISIS, but it's not pretty. 
and these militias are not coherent. And now they are being bombed by the Russians. ISIS isn't being bombed. And now that the Russians are in the game, it is very hard to figure out what the U.S. can do now, which is why I wish the U.S. would be more active in Iraq and approach it from that perspective. Obama has sent 50 special forces to try to help uh, local forces fight, but it's basically to help the Kurds. And the Kurds are a separate issue. <laughs> this is not going to get rid of ISIS. This is not going to stop the fighting in Syria. I basically think that we have lost the fight in Syria. Uh, the Russians and the Iranians have won. Assad will have uh, a mini state that will include Damascus and uh, an area that connects that with the coastal areas. And the rest of Syria will become a wasteland where Sunni militias and ISIS fight each other. And that will be poisonous. And frankly, at this point, I'm not sure how we handle that. But that is why I think it's so urgent for Obama to focus on Iraq and do more than he is doing, because there are fighters on the ground there who can be activated, not just the Kurds, but Sunni tribes, and he still won't do it, and I can't figure out why. Um, so uh, let me just sum up, because I know that you have questions. I don't think we can ignore the region for the reasons that I've said. I think that we cannot send large amounts of troops in there. That just feeds the ISIS narrative and would bring in more foreign volunteers. I think we have to help people on the ground that are willing and capable of fighting, and we haven't done enough about that yet. I think we have to recognize that we have lost the chance to get rid of Assad in the near future, and at this point, getting rid of Assad would probably make things worse, although I think his remaining there guarantees that Syria will be de facto divided. And I think we have to be very nimble in future strategy because there are not going to be neat solutions. There is not a situation now where you can have an international conference that can redraw the map. Uh, there are not a, a concert of powers the Europeans and the Americans who can have a Lausanne conference like they did after World War I and divvy up the Middle East. Uh, you have the United States and Russia at loggerheads with totally different interests. You have Saudi Arabia and Iran with totally different interests. There is no group of powers that is on the same page and can impose order on the region and draw new boundaries. So I think Syria will be a mess for some time to come. The only hope is to contain it and to drive back ISIS from Iraq and weaken them that way and wait for new opportunities to arise. I wish that the administration would drop its illusions, illusions that Iran and Russia are going to help bring a solution to Syria because they are not. They have their own interests there, which are guaranteed to make the situation worse. And this administration refuses, refuses to get this. And so, you know, I worry, I don't think we can forget about the Middle East, but just remembering it doesn't mean you can avoid the spillover of poison. Uh, um, you know, I hope that Hillary is thinking seriously about this. Uh, I have not heard anything, certainly from the Republicans that inter that um, it convinces me that any of them remotely have a grasp of what's going on there or what to do. And I think the Middle East is going to haunt us for some years to come and provide me with material for columns which are unsatisfying <laughs> because I can't outline clearly what should be done. And I'll stop there. And I'll take questions. Would it make things better, in your opinion, if we supported the breakup of Iraq in three different areas? Um, you, you know, I think, again, that there was a misconception about the breakup into three areas. When, when Joe Biden talked about this, and of course he claimed he didn't talk about the breakup, he claims that he talked about federalism, but everybody took it to mean the breakup. It comes back to this issue of who's going to draw the map. 
Um, there was no way to officially break Iraq up. Um, it, when he first put that idea forward, uh, Baghdad was a much more mixed city than it is today. There's been a lot of ethnic cleansing since. There were belts around Baghdad which were much more mixed. The Shiites are now cleaning a lot of that of Sunnis and driving them out, which contributes to this horrible internal refugee problem in Iraq. It, it was never a neat tripartite split. And because it wasn't neat, you were going to have this fighting. You know, furthermore, um, the Constitution of Iraq provides for federalism. And, and you could legally set up an Iraq that would effectively be divided into Sunni provinces, maybe more than one, Shiite and, and Kurdish, with maybe, although the Constitution doesn't provide for that, a special status for Baghdad. They'd have to revise the Constitution. But the Shiite-led government won't go for it. I mean, they won't, uh, and even, uh, even the idea of a Shiite third of Iraq, it's slightly more than a third, makes the government nervous because once you start down that road, um, you have the southern province of Basra wanting to split off and control its oil revenue, sort of like Alaska. But this is not the United States, you know. I mean, this is the, the, the Iraqi government lives off that revenue. There's no other income in the country. Um, and so there has never been a way to do this short of war. And, and so while de facto that is where things have headed, the central government is unwilling, and for, for and just one more point, the National Guard idea that Sunni tribes are asking for is the perfect example of why it's so difficult to talk about <coughs> dividing Iraq into three states, even if you use Biden's terminology of federal states. What the Sunnis have asked for is, in essence, what the Americans devised during the surge that you had Sunni tribal fighters who were sort of amalgamated into a fighting force, they got a salary from the Americans. And when the Americans pulled out, the central government was supposed to continue that salary and uh, subsume those forces into the official Iraqi military, part of them into the official army, but a part of them into National Guard units that would basically stay in their home turf. The Shiite-led government, Shiite political parties, and Iran, uh, which pulls a lot of the strings in Iraq, never wanted that to happen because they didn't want Sunnis to be armed under any circumstances. And they were fearful that if you allowed these militias to set up, even though technically they would be under the commander-in-chief of the Iraqi army, that somehow they might take, try to take Baghdad. I don't think that's the case. I think the Sunnis understand that that day is over. But the fact is that the central government wants to screw the Sunnis, backed by, or maybe not the prime minister, he's more rational, but he has a knife in his back. The Iranian overlord, viceroy, who's basically calling the tune, a general named Qasem Soleimani, his ideology, his worldview was formed by fighting Iraq on the battlefield for 10 years in the Iran-Iraq war. He hates Iraqi Sunnis. He sees them all as creatures of Saddam Hussein. He wants to screw them. He doesn't care if they suffer. And so when you have that branch of the Iranian government, the Revolutionary Guards, in charge, uh, prodding the Shiite political parties in Baghdad, there's no way you can get to what you're talking about because the Sunnis will never be given a share. If they had been, if Iran had been smart enough to let them form the National Guard, they would have fought ISIS, which is in Iran's interest. But the Iranians won't act rationally on this. And so you can't neatly split it. And it's the same in Syria right now. Uh, you know, if, if Iran and Russia were willing to compromise, but they have different interests. So what might be possible if you had some neat conference in Lausanne, like 1923, where everyone was on the same page, it's just not possible now. Yes? Your colleague, Thomas Friedman, I hope I may call him that, he opines that uh, some of the instability, especially among ISIS, the uh, 
extremism is a form of Wahhabi Islam. Wahhabi Islam, which flows out of these madrasas funded by Saudi Arabia. Would addressing that somehow, if we have leverage with the Saudis somehow? Uh, uh, <coughs> Tom is right, this is something I've written about a lot too. It's very distressing. The difference between Saudi Arabia and ISIS or Al Qaeda is that the same ideology is taught in Saudi religious schools with a caveat. In the Saudi religious schools, they teach that <coughs> Islam is superior, uh, Shiites are apostates, uh, Jews and Christians are inferior, everybody else is infidels. Um, uh, you know, the period of the righteous caliphates is what we should aspire to. Uh, women should be kept out of sight and out of mind. But don't attack your rulers, because that would cause fitna, which means conflict between Muslims. That's the caveat. That's the caveat. So because that was the deal that, you know, back when uh, the first Saud ruler made a pact uh, with Ibn Wahhab, uh, the, the uh, tribal chief who, pro who propagated this form of Islam, the deal was, you set the religious tone, we rule the kingdom. And that deal still holds, although you don't have a neat tribal group that's Wahhabis. Now, the Wahhabi ideology infuses the country. And even educate, Western educated Saudis will complain when asked, they send their kids to private school to try to keep them from getting this stuff. But the government requires that so many periods of religion be taught even in private schools. That's why they try to send their kids to education outside. But what's worse is the Saudis propagated overseas. And they've been doing it ever since uh, Ayatollah Khomeini came back to Iran. Uh, starting in the 80s, you saw it. You saw it on the West Bank, although until now it hasn't taken such a hold. I'm afraid it will take a greater hold in the future if Palestinian territorial nationalism goes down because it's not getting anywhere and religious war comes up. I saw it in Central Asia. I mean, in 1997, I remember I was in Uzbekistan and, and I was in um, uh, the Fergana Valley, which is a traditionally Islamic uh, uh, Valley, and you had um, uh, a, a president in um, Uzbekistan, he's still the president for life, who was a former Soviet operachnik, a, a tough ruler who tries to suppress Islam, but you had the beginning of a return of religiosity once the, the official Soviet repression was gone, and it was a sort of peaceful Sufi kind of religiosity, and um, an imam, a well-known charismatic imam who was a Sufi, had disappeared. And I went uh, to um, uh, Andajan in, in the Fergana Valley to, to try to find the missing imam. And, and uh, he had gone to the airport and was never heard of again. Now, um, Karimov, the dictator, was trying to suppress the return of religiosity. And this imam had lots of followers, but he was a nonviolent imam. And what I found, you know, you know, sneaking around, talking to some of his followers who were scared and nervous, was that um, the Saudis, they said, had been sending in uh, clerics to propagate a more violent kind of Islam. And sure enough, in the next town, in Namangan, you had violent jihadis who were also being suppressed. But it was a kind of movement that had not been seen in, in um, uh, Uzbekistan before. And now the Uzbeks form a key part of the jihadi movement. Um, now, the Saudis don't want people, Islamists, rising up against them. But they are sending out preachers who are propagating a kind of Islam that encourages jihadis to rise up against other people. And it's coming back to bite them. So the Saudis were funding Islamists in Syria. Now, they weren't fighting, funding ISIS. Because they're afraid of ISIS. ISIS is too radical. They're afraid it'll bite them. But they were funding groups whose ideology was ISIS once removed. I mean, again, uh, groups that are a little bit smarter, a little bit sharper, and are not trying to set up a caliphate. They just claim to be aiming for a Syrian Islamic state. But uh, you know, not something that's going to help the Middle East. And the Saudis, Saudi money is everywhere. When I first went into Kurdistan uh, after Saddam fell, and I was going around in 
2000, it was before Saddam fell, just before, I was there in 2002, 2003, just before the war started, I came into Iran and, and people were taking me around and there were all these mosques that had plaques on them built with money from Saudi Arabia. And they were built in the Gulf style, not looking like um, uh, <clears throat> traditional Kurdish mosques. And you would see women in black uh, abayas, which is not native to uh, Kurdistan, where the women traditionally wore very brightly colored dresses with a very loose, gauzy white headscarf. And you know, so you see it everywhere. It's poison. And the U.S. has never known what to do about it. I, every government has cultivated the Saudis, and even more so now. I mean, we're supporting them in a war in Yemen, which is insane, where the Saudis are bombing civilians. Um, because, uh, you know, I won't even go into it now if you've read, you know, the Houthis are Shiites and so forth. But anyway, let me just take a couple more questions. Be, uh, be, uh, uh, but anyway, yes, it's a real problem, and we don't know how to deal with it. So and, the Saudis can't get the Wahhabi Union back into the bottle. That's it. And they won't admit that it's a poisonous genie. They will fight you on it tooth and nail, even Saudi liberals from the uh, princely establishment. Um, uh, Prince Turkey, whose name you may see a lot, who comes to this country a lot and dresses in a Western fashion. But if you challenge him on this, he denies. There's nothing called Wahhabism. This is a Western myth. It, no, it's baloney. Uh, the lady back in green. You know, this is, <clears throat> this is such, uh, it's going to get worse. Um, there is no question it's going to get worse because the people that are fleeing now, if you have listened to the interviews, a lot of the people fleeing now were in pro-government areas. Um, and they're fleeing now because they understand that the fighting is going to continue and it's going to come to them and they've got to get out while they can. So the numbers are just, um, and I don't know what the answer is. I have been in one of the largest uh, Syrian refugee camps on the Jordanian border with Syria, and they're horrible. I mean, people, these are middle class people, and they're being reduced to living awfully. <coughs> they have caravans, little trailers, um, and uh, provided by the United Arab Emirates, at least they've done something. The Saudis have not contributed enough. And, it, you know, it's boiling hot in the summer, it's freezing cold in the winter. Only half the girls go to school, although all of them went to school in Syria, <coughs> because families are afraid to let their girls go out in a camp where there are strange men and there's no real control and they're not sure about the security. And so it's a disaster, and, uh, and the numbers keep growing, and I don't know what the answer is. So obviously the Europeans have a dog in this fight that we haven't, but as you know, we've let practically nobody in. One of the biggest shameful things, that I think, about the Obama administration, among many, is with all this fine talk about human rights, you know, even if they're afraid of letting Syrian Muslims in, although there's a two-year security process for every poor soul who tries to get in, so, uh, you know, the security process is broken, but still, it's there. Um, they haven't let the Yazidis in. They haven't let the Christians in. The Christian communities in um, the Middle East are being decimated. There's 200,000 Christian refugees in, in Erbil. We're not letting anyone in. <clears throat> so um, I, I don't know what the answer is. Another one that I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just taking one more question and then I have to go. If anyone has one and then I'll, uh, yes. Where, <clears throat> where's the media on this? Why isn't the media, point, the mainstream media now, pointing out the fiasco of the current administration, the so-called experts, Samantha Rice, Susan Powers, Valerie Jarrett, Susan, John Kerry, Susan Rice, Clinton, Samantha Powers. They yeah. failed, totally failed. Where is the media? Well, first of all, you know, it's not the job of the mainstream media uh, to write, I mean, that's editorializing. If you read what's written, um, the New York Times just had a front page story two days ago about how the Obama administration's program of training Syrians was a total failure, led the, the headlines. I mean, the New York Times is writing stories every other day of the week about failures. 
it's it, on the news pages. You don't have editorials saying uh, Susan Rice and Samantha Powers have failed. That's not their job. But they're writing about the failures of policy. It's on the front page every day. But the fact is that fewer and fewer newspapers have foreign bureaus. Uh, you know, we used to have a, a, a full-time person in Afghanistan. We don't. Almost nobody has full-time people in Baghdad, in Afghanistan anymore, because people don't want to read about it, and because newspapers are now judging stuff by how many hits it gets. So you'd get more story, uh, you know, more hits on a sick camel story than you would get on. Um, um, the New York Times has had enormous takeouts on the refugee problem and how intractable. Uh, you know, I mean, if you want to do a search, the Washington Post has basically given up on foreign coverage, except they have a wonderful woman in Beirut, but she can't do it all. Um, so, yeah, the coverage is out there. The question is who's reading it, who cares, and do people just want to forget about the Middle East? That's the problem. Anyway, um, thank you for listening. and. I bringing us this uh, informative, if not good news. Uh, I did have a question. I'll, I'll pose it to all of us. Um, I, when I see the whole situation, uh, and I see that a lot of the, uh, lot of the uh, discussion is about what we're doing and what Iran is doing and what is, you know, Russians are doing, we're, you know, it's a, an area that's being acted upon. And I don't know that that's how much better or worse or the same as it is as when it was in the last generation. With that happy thought, <laughs> um, thank you for coming, and we'll I'll see you next week. Bye bye.